I used to take very serious photographs, and um, uh, a couple years ago, I was on Facebook, and I had this very serious photograph like that as my uh, picture, and one of my friends, I noticed every single picture he was in, he looked like he was having a great time, he was always like, like that, in every single shot, and I, I ran into him, I hadn't seen him for many years, and ran into him and said, you know, you always look like you're having the best time in every, every time I see you on Facebook, and he's like, well, you know, you can smile or you can be frowned, so I like, hey, it's a good idea, so I went out and changed my profile photo, and I've been using uh, strange, funny, um, excited-looking pro profile pictures ever since, and it's actually improved my mood, because... Uh, I start actually feeling like, yeah, I am that happy person. I, I am enjoying what I'm doing. So it's a good thing. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, Seagate's reference architecture program and the hardware we are using for it. Um, so some, these are the topics I'm going to cover today. So just make sure you're in the right place. Uh, we've actually implemented some pretty large scale um, architectures using uh, Basho and React CS. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to cover the, uh, our reference architecture program, the hardware that we're using, um, how fast we can push that hardware, how we configure it, how we test it, how we test React CS, and um, how our customers test React CS, because no matter how many tests we do, our customers always come up with something else that they want to do. And um, so we actually have to set up some special things so that they can come in and test React CS on our hardware using their workloads. So I'm going to go through all of that. And um, before I start, I want to let people know um, there are places in here where I'm using IEC binary units. So anything that's a 1024 to a power of 2 or a power of 3 or a power of 4, you'll hear me say mebibytes or gibibytes or tebibytes. Uh, occasionally, I may say gebibytes, which is not correct, but um, I, I, or mibibytes. But it, that, this is what I'm talking about. So it's a 1024 to some power uh, rather than a 1,000 to some power. Um, so if I, if I say kilobytes or megabytes or gigabytes, uh, that's 1,000 to some power. Um, otherwise, it's uh, 1024 to a power. And the only reason I bring that up is that when you start doing performance testing and you're measuring things and you're using something like Basho Bench and it comes back and says, you know, you're writing this many um, megabytes per second and you go in and you check the code and it's actually using uh, 1,024 to a power of two, which is mebibytes, it makes a little bit of difference. Um, I should probably just go back through and, and change it all to one consistent uh, uh, reference, reference number, but I wanted to present all the numbers here just so people have some idea of what uh, the differences are. Um, so first, I wanted to talk about the reference architecture program. A um, little background, I was hired by a company called Xyrotex uh, in January this year, and so not too long ago. Um, at that time, Xyrotex did three things. They built storage enclosures. Um, and for large OEMs, Dell, uh, Pure Storage, use theirs, among others. Um, they also build and sell the cluster store file system. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it's a high-performance file system used by HPC uh, environments. And um, that comes as a rack-scale appliance, so you plug it in and you get this awesome high-speed uh, file system for your, for, your, uh, for your system, and it's extremely expensive. It's uh, sold to large institutions who really want to squeeze every last bit of performance out of something. Um, they also built test equipment. This is a totally different, robotic test equipment for disk drive manufacturing plants. So they built little robots that shove the disks in and out and test things and make sure that your disk drives, when they're coming off the line, worked correctly. And so I was hired on as a part of a small team that was going to do a fourth thing. So we're, instead of doing three things, we're going to do four. And then a few days before I started, Seagate announced that they were actually going to buy Xyrotex. So I was the um, most recent hire in a company on an experimental project being taken over by a much larger company. <laughs> Great position to be in if you want to make a group. No, actually it worked out really well. Um, I thought about it. I looked, at what the, I looked at what Seagate was doing. I looked at what we were doing. It looked like it was a good mesh. And uh, actually Seagate buying Xyrotex I think is probably one of the best things that could have happened to the company. So really good fit. Very happy I made the move. Um, where was that boss? No. Anyhow, so, um, uh, so anyhow, so the fourth thing that we were, I was hired to do was to figure out how to architect solutions that use that we can provision, configure, operate software that requires many, many petabytes of storage. Um, Seagate's got this idea that the future of storage is going to be two things uh, at the cloud level. You're going to have cheap and deep environments where people, all they care about is cost. They want to store lots and lots of stuff. Uh, they're not going to access it that often. This is like backups, this is image storage, this is archival video storage, cheap and deep, lots of storage, massive amounts, uh, lowest cost. And then there's going to be high performance, and that's going to be things where you are 
you know, object storage or file storage or block storage where you are storing lots of data, you're doing lots of analytics on it, you're doing uh, OLTP stuff on it, you are, um, so you need the speed. And there's not gonna be a whole lot in the middle in terms of the cloud market. Um, so so that's, that's sort of where we see things. So when we come up with a solution, we're trying to document first, what does the customer need? Is this a cheap or deep? Or is this a high performance? Um, the other thing with reference architectures, we want to document everything we do. We're going to give systems integrators and end users the best guidance we can give them so they can successfully implement these solutions. And we're going to work with ISVs like Basho so that they can sell their consulting services and support services to end users who set these systems up. And I'm going to, we're going to teach other people what we learn. So the idea here is that we cannot possibly sell every single solution on, that will run on our hardware. But if you've got a customer that comes to us and they say, hey, I want to put an eight petabyte solution into the market and I need um, to run React CS on that, how do I do that? And we can say, well, we've done this, we've used this hardware, these are the performance results we've gotten, uh, this is what we've done, this is how we've done it, this is how we configured everything, here's a white paper that goes through every single setting in Linux that we changed, and here you go, is this what you want? And they say, yeah, that's pretty close, we actually want these other things, and we say, okay, well, we can test that out, we've got this lab set up, we can actually go through some of these tests and find out if we can do what you want to do. So the whole idea behind this is we're going to try different things, we're going to test different things, we're going to do it in a very um, documented uh, manner, and then we can tell people this is what we found out when we tried this at this scale. And um, hopefully people can use that information to uh, build good systems that work well and operate well and, and do the things they want to do. So um, for hardware-wise, um, the hard, sure. We charge for the hardware. We sell hardware. Um, we are not charging for like the white papers per se. If you engage Seagate professional services, um, they would charge for that. But you know, there's no. There, we our customers. We have customers who are like do-it-yourselfers, and they're going to buy the. We're going to say, hey, this is what we found out that you could do with this. This is what we found. You know, this is how we did it. And they say, oh, great, that sounds good. And then they buy our hardware, and then they figure it out on their own, and we make the money on the hardware, and that's it. Um, or they might say they want to engage us. They might want to engage Basho. They uh, might want to engage a, a systems integrator of some sort to help them w on their site. We'll work with all of those people. And um, you, know, you engage us more, we charge more. Engage us less, we just charge for hardware. So we're, we're happy in any of those cases. So um, for hardware-wise, uh, disk enclosures. Xyrotex makes a number of different disk enclosures. Uh, common ones, 12, 24, 84 disk enclosures made by Xyrotex and now Seagate. Um, these are a little odd. I mean, you've probably seen storage you know, hardware in the, in the shopping mall. You've got a, you know, a chassis, and it's got a computer in it, and it's got some disk drives. Um, Xyrotex makes these ones with these storage bridge bay modules in the back. And they're basically two sockets in the back of these chassis. And an SBV module can be a compute module. Uh, it can be uh, just, a, 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 just give you SAS connectivity. So we call those, um, turn, it in, turn the box into a JBOD. Uh, or what we call an EBOD, which is enhanced bunch of disks. Um, not just a bunch of disks. Uh, the, uh, so SPV IO modules can, you can use them to turn a chassis into a compute node with lots of storage, or you can turn it into uh, just a box that you can attach to external servers. And you can even daisy chain, if, you're, if your compute nodes are really low, you can actually daisy chain multiple disk enclosures together using SAS cables and just get lots and lots of storage on you know, very little compute, or you can attach lots of computers to one chassis and have lots of compute for the same disk. So lots of different ways. This is why it gets confusing. This is why we, this is why customers come to us and they say, I want to build this. How do I do this? And how do I fit all these pieces together to make this happen? So we try to give them some guidance and show them what works and what doesn't. Uh, this is one of the boxes we sell. This is a uh, CP2584. The two is uh, second generation SAS. The five is, it's a 5U chassis. 84 is the number of disk drives inside of it. So each one of those drawers has uh, 42 disks, um, and that's in 5U. Uh, I'm currently using four terabyte drives, so that's 336 terabytes of storage in 5U uh, raw. And um, the uh, we're getting uh, six terabyte disks next month to test with, and we've got eight terabytes on the horizon sometime 2015. 
Um, so, uh, you know, do the math. Uh, 84 times whatever size disk you put in here is is uh, is your capacity per 5U. Um, just a real quick diagram, just to kind of show you what's in there. You can see at the top uh, of the, on the back of the module, there's the two SBB modules. Those are um, EBODs. So you've got three SAS connections on each one of them. Uh, five cooling modules, AKA fans, uh, and two power supplies. Um, these boxes, the ones I'm using, run on three-phase power. Uh, they also, we also do European power um, standards. Um, I do not know all the different power supplies that we support, but I know there are more than one. But uh, the ones I'm familiar with are the US um, three-phase power. Oh, yeah, and everything in there is hot swappable. So you pop something up, pop it in. So anyhow, so we've got, uh, so like I said, we've got two EBODs. For this particular project that I'm working on, this thing called Stratostore, we've picked um, two EBODs per, uh, per chassis. Um, and each of those has the four, three four-lane SAS V2 connectors. Um, since this is uh, since we're setting these up as eBonds, we're going to use an external server. So we also um, are using these Intel server modules. They these are a uh, these are an Intel server chassis. It's a two U chassis and it has four compute modules in it. And we've populated six of the bays. So basically, in four U, we've got uh, six um, compute nodes and room for two more. Um, because we're running React and for this application, we went with 128 gigabytes per compute node, uh, since each one of them is dealing with 336 gig, uh, terabytes of raw storage. And um, we've got uh, dual SFP, 10 gig E IO in the back. We've got, um, and we've got six gigabit SAS, uh, two, uh, two connections on each one, and we're using like LSI for that. Um, we also have some network connectivity. We have two Arista switches, um, 10 gig E switches. Uh, those are their specs. And that's what the cabinet looks like. So basically we will, we have these built these cabinets and um, somebody comes along and says, hey, I need two, you know, two petabytes or more of React storage. We can just plug one of these cabinets in and it's all built, ready to go. And you just have to load your software on, configure it how you want it. Um, we are not actually selling the software configured on here. That's what the, the um, uh, white paper idea is, the uh, rack reference architecture. We will just tell people this is how to set it up. Um, but it's, and we will wire it up, we will set it up, we will bring it to your place, we will plug it in. Um, but we're really trying to guide people into setting up their own systems uh, so for their own maintenance and for their own, uh, their, because each, site is so different and each application requires certain types of tuning so we really want people to understand what they are doing and what, what their application needs in order to use this hardware. And um, so first we're going to get into like the theoretical performance limits and then we're going to go into some actual performance limits. So theoretically, um, so either the network, we, we actually, we set these up initially as two separate 10 gig E networks. So we have a public network where the data comes in and a private network where React is using for internode communication. And we, I mean, we could have uh, done some network binding and just and made a 20 gig E network, but we were trying to understand what the different performance um, uh, characteristics were of the data network versus the public network. So we decided we'd just separate them initially for our first set of tests and kind of see how that performed. And do, that way we could take different measurements on each of the, each of the two networks and see what was going on there. Um, 10 gigabit ethernet has a theoretical limit of 10 gigabits per second, which is 1.25 gigabytes per second or 1.16 gigabytes per second. So um, I got that off Wikipedia. And uh, that's actually been pretty true because when we tested this using iperf 3 we found we could drive any, a leak between any two hosts about 9.92 uh, gigabits per second. So pretty close to the theoretical limit. Uh, for SAS, um, 84 disks, one compute node, and we have two four lane LSI SAS connectors from the compute node to the chassis. So one lane, six gigabits per second. Uh, if we spread that I.O. across multiple disks, we're talking about 48 gigabits per second. Um, SAS overhead, two bits per byte, so it's about 4.8 gigabytes per second or 4.47 gigabytes per second of SAS bandwidth per compute node. Now obviously you can't, it's, it's running in parallel, so you're thinking of lots of parallel writes to different disks. You're not gonna drive one drive at that speed, but if your writes are spread out across all the disks, that's the theoretical limit. 
and then um, I'm just going to do a real quick primer on or a little, re little review of RAID. Uh, I won't get into this too deeply, but the other thing is that since React wants one big file system, um, we have to use RAID. So we're going to use RAID 5 or RAID 6. Um, and also because you, uh, the read five and read six have this read write modify pattern where you're um, you're doing a certain number of IOPS just to com to pull the parity off the disk, compute the new parity when you write, and then write it back out. So, say you've got a chunk size of 32k and your write is 32k or less, even though it's just going into one chunk. With RAID five, you've got a minimum of two reads. You've got to read the the chunk with the data, you got to read the chunk with the parity, you got to recompute the parity, you've got to write the new data back out, you got to write the new parity back out. Four IOPS on RAID 5, uh, six on RAID 6. And so, because of that, the most efficient write you're going to get is if you're writing the whole stripe at once. So, um, if you, so what we were, so we tried different chunk sizes, different numbers of disks in each RAID set. Um, trying to figure out what the best balance was of object size to write speed and read speed. And um, a couple things to keep in mind, more disk you add to a RAID, larger the stripe, larger stripe, small write becomes less and less efficient. So you got lots of small writes, uh, lots of disks in a RAID set, not so good. Um, fewer disks per RAID set make small writes faster, but it also means you're gonna waste more disks on RAID overhead uh, for your parity disks. So there's a balance. Um, and then you've also got this problem when, when once you build your RAID sets and you put them into a volume manager, um, your volume manager and your file system may also attempt to stripe across. And you want to make sure that the stripes match up so that you're not fighting your RAID uh, striping with your volume manager or, or with your file system. And the, volume, the file systems like XFS has a maximum uh, chunk size of about 256K. So once you get beyond that, um, it stops being very efficient. It starts, it starts splitting things up and you get weird performance problems. So, so I just want to give a little preview of that. I'm going to get back to that in a second and get, you know, tell you some of the tests we ran to make sure that we were doing this the best way we possibly could. Um, so configuring this all of this. So we decided, these are our goals for our test environment. We had to be able to rebuild everything, anytime, from bare metal. Uh, when we did rebuild it, we wanted the OS to be installed the same way every single time. We wanted it to be configured the same way every time. We wanted the same packages installed. We wanted them config all the packages configured the same way each time. Um, we also needed to be able to monitor the clusters so that um, if, we, if you're running a test and you're trying to get performance data and one of your RAID arrays fails, uh, throw the performance data out because it's the RAID array is rebuilding. So we had to be able to monitor things. I mean, we, it wasn't in production. We're not getting up in the middle of the night being paged, but we need to know um, if something has failed or if something's not working quite right so that, you know, we know to fix that before we start doing more performance tests so we have uh, good, good things that we can compare. Um, we also wanted to collect data on uh, our network interfaces, how they're doing, what the CPU is doing, what the RAM is doing, what the disk usage is doing, so we're going to have performance stats on all of this stuff. Um, we also wanted to create an automated test framework. We wanted to be able to set the, send the same tests against the data over and over and over again. So when we change something, we could run the same set of tests again and say, hey, do we get better performance numbers? Do we get worse? How, um, how, how did that work? Was that any good? And so um, anyhow, and then also, like I said, we had customers that want to test this stuff. We didn't want to teach our customers how to use you know, Basho Bench and how to set up a Basho Bench config file each time. So we wanted to create a web-based interface so they could come in and just like, I want to run that test and get data back. And that they could actually set tests up that would mimic their application interfaces. So those were all of our goals. So to get there, we used Cobbler and Kickstart for the bare metal rebuilds. We used Scientific Linux as our OS. We were using Ansible for the configuration of the system, Nagios for monitoring, Munin for the system performance graphs, FIO for RAID and file system performance. Network, we were using, uh, we were using JNET top, iPerf3, and SAR. Um, iPerf3 is nice for generating load. JNET top tells you what your network's doing right now, and so does and SAR tells you what your network's doing right now and logs it to disk. Um, JNet top, if you ever use it, it's like, looks like top, but it's for your network. Um, object storage performance, we're using Cosbench and Basho Bench. 
Um, we thought it was very important to have two different ways of generating load on the object system so we could compare the numbers. So we wouldn't say, hey, these are great numbers, and it turned out that one of them was generating faulty numbers. So we thought, well, let's use two different systems, two different ways of getting the same number, and see how they compare. And they actually were you know, pretty much in line. You know, they, you'd run a test in Cosbench, you'd run a, the same you know, comparable test in Basho Bench, and the numbers were pretty much spot on every time. So um, that was a good sanity check, but, uh, and it worked out good, so we, we have, uh, can rely on our numbers. And then for web UI, um, we're using a custom Django uh, web UI that we wrote. And uh, versions, um, we are running uh, React Enterprise Edition 1.48. We're using uh, CS 1.45, Stanchion 1.43, and HAProxy 1.5, just in case anyone cares. Uh, no, we're not running React 2.0 yet. So um, uh, anyhow, that, it wasn't released at the time we were starting to do all these tests, so we kind of stuck with a, a stable 1.48 version. Um, when we want to rebuild a cluster, we tell, we reboot everything with Pixie Boot, Cobbler installs the OS and the set of packages, Ansible adds more packages, installs the SSH keys, configures everything. We have a script called build MD raid, which is a custom Python script, and that sets up our raid, the LVM, the XFS on the enclosure based on, uh, there's like a, a default for what we usually set up when we're not testing raid, but we can also set that up to try different raid configurations and see what kind of results we get. Um, and then Ansible installs and configures the React, React CS stanchion and HA proxy. Um, everything there except for the build MD raid takes about 45 minutes. So we can go from bare metal to fully built cluster, monitored in Nagios, generating stats in about 45 minutes, except for the build MD raid. Yes, sir. Um, our Ansible stuff is our Ansible stuff available. Um, right now it's not, it's, it's, but I don't think it's secret sauce per se. Um, I get different answers depending on who I'm asking internally. <laughs> so if you're a customer, if you're, if you're an integrator coming to us and you're saying, hey, I've got this customer and they'd like to buy, you know, several million dollars worth of hardware, I think we'll probably share it with you. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think there's going to be a problem with that. Uh, but um, I, I'm pushing and pushing and pushing to open source as much of our stuff as possible and to open source as much of our results as possible. And... There are some people internally who say, oh no, we should only make these reports available to systems integrators and people who have signed an NDAs. And it's like, no, we should give this everyone. So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a battle back and forth on that. So I, I don't, I'm sorry I don't have a really straight answer for you on that, but yeah. Come to us with a customer with lots of money and uh, I'm sure we can share them with you. Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, there's guys at the table out there in business suits who would love to talk to you. All right, so um, uh, anyhow, um, so like I said, I'll take about 45 minutes and we go from zero to fully built cluster monitored. Um, the build MD RAID, uh, interestingly enough, if, if you're building uh, 336 terabytes of MD RAID storage, it takes about three days. Um, so I do the first steps, kick off build MD RAID, come back three days later, uh, do the React install. Um, that was not good for testing, especially when you're testing lots of MD RAID uh, versions. So we actually, there's a, there's a cheat mode in there called uh, test mode build, which basically just uses 50 gigabytes from each disk. And um, that way it takes about an hour to do the MD RAID build. And we can, we, that was so we could test out different RAID configurations and see how they, they worked. So once we found a set that we liked, then we'd just we'd say, we'd do the three day build and build the whole thing. So just a side note. Um, if you're trying to build, do this and trying to test this in your own lab, uh, that's a good that's a good trick to try. Um, once again, uh, to answer, kind of follow up on your earlier question, I'm trying to get build MD RAID open sourced because it works with enclosures. You give it an enclosure ID. You tell it looks at how many disks you have. It can calculate out the best way to set that up with XFS and LVM and all the other stuff, and um, and go build it. And uh, I'm trying. <laughs> working real hard to get that open sourced right now. And then, like I said, there's this kind of battle back and forth. It's like, well, gee, that's our intellectual property. And, and it's like, no, we should give this away so that people can help us make it better and, uh, and work within more and more environments because we can't possibly support everything ourselves. So that's the battle going on right now. But um, hope, hope to release that someday soon. Um, React configuration. Um, so all of the recommended things on the Basho website for what you want to do for network disk OS, all those recommended performance configurations we have done. Uh, we've also made some other minor changes recommended by Basho when we were getting into testing. Um, these are all 
documented in the white paper. And then we made some additional changes um, just to avoid TCP in-cast issues. And if anyone here is not familiar with TCP in-cast, it's um, when you get a loaded network and you've got lots of nodes talking to each other and you have lots of collisions on your ethernet, um, they'll, you'll start getting uh, you know, collision retries. And then the uh, default retry limit is about 200 micro milliseconds. So that delay between retries can actually have a cascading effect and, and bring your network speed down and up and down and up and down and up. So you just, one of those tuning steps is to drop your RTO down to about as low as you can go, which in our case was about five milliseconds. Um, there's a really good article. This is the guy that kind of tipped me off to all this, uh, snickles.com. Um, uh, what is this? Humans Hit and Hippos Together, I think is the name of his blog. Um, no idea where that came from, but uh, a really good article on TCP and CAST, and he has a bunch of links that are even more detailed if you're interested. Um, anyhow, so all that, what all that means is that we now have known hardware. We have a known OS. We have same versions of the same packages every time. We have the, configured the same way every time, and we have a set of tests that we can rerun every time. So this means we, can sh we have a known baseline, and we can change one thing, and we can see what impact it has, and that's great because... You have people coming to you and saying, hey, what if we threw some SSDs in there? What if we did, what if we used SSDs for doing uh, journaling, you know, logging, doing file system journaling for XFS? What if we did this? What if we did that? What effect on performance does this have? So now we can actually test that and we can say, okay, well, journaling has about a, you know, pops up the performance of, on the disk of a, at about 8%. So we have a known number here because we can try it with, with the SSD journaling and without the SSD journaling and run the same test and get, you know, get solid performance numbers back. So this is um, you know, having the way to rebuild the system over and over again and then just change one thing is really important uh, for qualifying all this hardware and figuring out how to do all this stuff. So getting on to testing. So here's the actual testing. So once we have this all set up, um, I did want to verify SAS bandwidth without RAID overhead. So just to make sure that I, you know everything was set up right and the hardware was working and I actually could saturate my SAS channels, I went and built a big RAID 0 stripe, 84 disks. Not a good idea in production. <laughs> Not something you want. But you know, there's no, there's no RAID overhead in this case. So um, when I did that, FIO had no problem saturating all eight lanes. Uh, I could write data at 48 gigabits per second across all the disks and um, uh, work just worked just great. And it would probably continue to work just great until you had one disk failure, in which case you'd lose all 84 disks <laughs> worth of data, which is why you don't want to do this in production. But um, it was a good sanity test just to make sure that SAS was working right. Um, and then React, because it wants the single large volume per, com per compute node, so we had to have some sort of RAID. Tried a bunch of different ways. Um, and oh, I also want to say, Different configurations of RAID have different performance characteristics depending on your object size. This is very important. So React CS, the largest object it's going to write to the disk is one mibibyte. Or mibibyte, 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 mibibyte. Bleh. So it's going to break everything into um, these chunks of data. So they won't get bigger than that. So if you throw an eight mibibyte file at uh, a CS cluster, it's going to break that into eight chunks and write them into eight separate places. And... Um, so you know that's your maximum, and that, that's adjustable. That's what we have it set to. That's the default. Um, but you know that's, that's your maximum write size. But your minimum size could be one byte. So eh, probably not. But, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no minimum on it. Um, there's some overhead with React. So that's why I say you can't really write one byte because there's, there's metadata and such. But um, uh, objects could be stored range and size from one, one byte to one maybe byte. So you... The, the, and the performance characteristics of RAID are different depending on how your, um, what your object uh, spread is. So um, we basically I ran, ran that build MD RAID test over and over and over again on you know, a bunch of different boxes. And we'd like set up RAID on six different boxes, six different ways. We'd run these FI, automated FIO tests, gather all the data, pull it into a spreadsheet, uh, wipe the boxes, run, you know, do it again. Uh, did that for a couple of weeks. Um, ran over 500 different tests and found that for a best overall range of performance, if you had objects from 10 kibibit bytes to one mibibyte in size, was 16 RAID 5 arrays, five disks each, four global spares. And um, 
like I said, that is a, that's not the fastest performance for any object size in there, but it's a good spread for the objects within that size. If you were always writing one megabyte objects, for instance, there are better ways to configure your disks. If you're always writing tiny disks or tiny objects and you're never writing anything over 100K, this is not a good, this is not a good uh, setup for that. So knowing what kinds of objects you're writing, the size of the objects, how, what your uh, ratio of reads to writes to deletes, um, knowing those things is very important when you're setting up a system like this. Um, the other thing I, we found out that <clears throat> um, even, even after all these uh, exhaustive testing, um, in this particular case, uh, network bandwidth uh, is actually the, was the limitation. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. I'm giving away the story, but network bandwidth was um, in, the, we had in this configuration was the limiting factor. So you could actually do other rating configurations, like you could do you know, four sets of 21 disks in RAID 6 if you wanted to, make more use of um, have fewer parity disks. You'd get a slower FIO performance, but it didn't matter because your, your, your network was limiting your performance before it got to that point anyways. So there's, anyhow, so lots of things to consider. Know what your application needs to do. Know your object size. Know your, um, know your read, write, delete ratios. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Sure, that'd be great for performance. A one zero, RAID one zero, for, or RAID ten for performance. Sure, that'd be great. But you'd also you'd you'd waste half your disks. So there's a cost trade-off. So the the whole point of the, this is all about cost and cost trade-offs. So you've already got three times penalty for running React. So you're you're writing every object three times. And now you just cut your disk size. You're, you're basically buying twice as many disks and paying for twice as much power because you're on a RAID 10. So you can do that, uh, and you'll get better performance. And maybe that makes sense for your application. I, I don't know. Like, like I said, this is why I said may, really need to know your application. Are you trying to go cheap and deep? Or are you trying to do high performance analytics? It makes a difference. Do you have a set of RAID 5 to Um, you basically don't pay a raid penalty when you go to raid 10. So there's, so it's just like it's it's um, you're paying, you're getting fewer spindles because you're you're, you're cutting your disk size in half, but um, your your uh, write penalty uh, goes away. So um, you're you can you can pretty much saturate your SAS channels at, with raid 10. So you know you're 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 limited by the amount of SAS bandwidth you have, and. Um, I was only trying two of the four lane connectors per compute node to the chassis. Um, with the compute nodes we were using, there's only room in them for one card, and I had uh, two, you know, the, the SAS cards we had had two four lane connectors. I, we probably could have tried like a, you know, four, four four lane connectors and gotten even better bandwidth out of that. Uh, I don't know, I didn't test that configuration, so. But um, yeah, you're right, RAID 10, much better performance, cost goes up. Per, per byte stored. Yes, sir. Um, we have not tried RAID, uh, RAID Z or ZFS on this particular platform um, with React. We have we have used it for other uh, on other enclosures for other projects. Um, uh, it, it's it's like I said, we have. X amount of equipment and X amount of resource. You know, you see, it's a huge company. So you think, oh, they could throw, they could throw hundred people at this thing, and they probably could, but they aren't. So they, <laughs> we have a smaller team, you know, and, and limited lab space. So you, we basically we say, okay, we're gonna, we know these are the tests we want to run. We reserve this the lab space for for these tests, and 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 RAID Z and ZFS is one of the ones that's scheduled, um, but hasn't haven't done it yet. That's the other, yeah. Yeah, so the comment, the comment for anyone watching at home, uh, Basher does not support CFS with the comment. So um, that, and that was probably the reason why we didn't go down that route and we stuck with XFS. So yes, sir. With the red time game, I have the network the same with Network would be the, th in this particular configuration with a single uh, 10 gig E network connection with the, on the data side, um, network is still gonna be your limiting factor whether you're using RAID 10 or RAID 5 or RAID 6. Um, the disk, uh, the disk were always faster than the network. 
So, and I actually I've got some numbers coming up here on another slide to show that. So, um, so I just already went over this one. So this is the uh, RAID React CS how it splits it up. Um, so when we tested it, we created automated tests. We ran all these tests, got that information out. Um, we also tested network performance just to verify. We ran iperf three. Uh, this shows us that we weren't doing anything stupid, that we actually did have, you know, all the bandwidth there for the network um, that was available on the network because we want to make sure that, okay, is, is, the, is the switch operating correctly? Are, are all of our network cards operating correctly? Do we have a bad cable somewhere <laughs> that's, that's dropping out? So by running iperf 3 from uh, every connection to every other connection, mm -hmm. we could verify, uh, in, in an automated fashion, we could verify that the network was actually working correctly, and it was. Um, doesn't really tell you about real world uh, applications, but it does tell you that everything's working correctly. Um, so when we test React CS, we had, uh, we had, like I said, we had Basho Bench and Cost Bench. So for Basho Bench, we would create tests using one load generating server. We would do one to 250 simultaneous connections. Um, we did read, write, and delete operations, uh, separate tests. Um, or I'm sorry, read, write, or delete operations. Uh, Basho Bench doesn't like you doing the same operation, two different operations from the same uh, load generator. Um, and file size, uh, we used a single size of file for each of these tests. Cosbench is a little more flexible. For Cosbench, we could actually use, we were using four load generating servers. So we had four super micro servers plugged into the network. Um, and they were, uh, they were generating for different tests, anywhere from one to 250 simultaneous connections. Um, we could do read, write, and delete operations, one operation for a test, or we could do a mix of all three. Um, we could duration from one minute to 24 hours. Uh, I mean, we could do it longer than that. That was as long as we picked. Yes, sir? Uh, what's the number of transactions? Transactions per second? I don't have numbers on that, actually. Um, we have, um, I was looking at the you know, object sizes, and we were, a lot of times we were doing one um, maybe byte test. Yeah, the 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 uh, couple of people that we had looking at this uh, when we were first doing this were all like photo sharing sites and video sh sites. So typical write was about one meb one megabyte or so. One, uh, and so we were doing a lot of uh, file sizes around that for testing, and it was write write heavy. So we were doing a lot of write heavy tests, um, and we were checking uh, bytes per second was the thing we were really most interested in for the whole cluster. Um, so if you look at the, our object size and you look at the bytes per second, you, you can divide, you can, yeah, you can get the number. We did. I just don't have the numbers with me. So I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, th I thought of that this morning as I was going through this. I'm like, I didn't do any, I, I didn't have the objects per second data here. And we actually, we actually do have that. Um, but I, I just, I just didn't bring it with me. Um, and then, like I said, Cosbench, you can also do a mix of file sizes. So you can, you can write a bunch of different object sizes at the same time or one object size. So, um, so when we did this, RAID system, file system setup, we, we're getting like 1.2 to 1.6 gigabytes per second, write speeds per compute node at the XFS file system level. Um, so theoretically, if, if everything was distributed across the entire cluster, you know, 7.2 to 9.6 gigabit, gigabytes per second, gigabytes per second across the entire cluster. So that's why I said, right, you know, network speed is much below that. Um, theoretical limit of our 10 gig e network is 1.16 gigabits, gigabytes per second. And we've measured point to point speeds of 1.15. So that's pretty good. Um, so we expected the main hardware limit to be the 10 gig e network. And what we found was we were actually seeing React CS speeds closer to 375. And we we're scratching our heads and trying to figure out why are we seeing, you know, this is you know, much slower than we'd expected. And, you know, it's got three times rights. So when you think about it, uh, data comes in, hits a node with six nodes and uh, three writes. We're expecting that there's a, um, with three writing times replications, there's a 50-50 chance that when you come in, you're going to hit the no a node where the data is being written. So half the time, uh, you're going to have the thing in the, and with my lovely arrows drawn on there by myself and somebody else's uh, much nicer ring. Um, Data comes into node one, half the time it's going to write to itself and two other nodes. Half the time it's going to say, yep, not, uh, I'm not stored here, and it's going to write to three other nodes. So on the data network, you're, you know, on average, you're going to have a data copied across the network two and a half times. So when you take that into account, um, 375 millibytes per second times two and a half 
0 0.9375, max expected speed 1.15. So we're running about 82% of the maximum network speed on a six node network, and that's with all the uh, ethernet collisions and retries and timeouts going on, because you know we're really pushing data at this network as hard as we can. And um, so you know, 82%, that's, that's, that's not too bad, and maximum network speed. Um, that's normally what I would expect to see on a network uh, under saturation conditions. So, um, uh, understandable. So, um, I'm going to say this. Uh, we did, like I said, we did tune the in-cast issue down, so that's, that's part of that 82% um, maximum network speed. And uh, we're thinking, okay, well, how can we get that even higher? And um, so we've got some upcoming tests. Obvious one, bond the two 10 gig e networks, get 20 gig e network, uh, um, connections. We've got the hardware there. Let's do some bonding and see um, where the limit is on that. Uh, we also want to do some more. There are some other uh, protocol enhancements to TCP for running TCP on a data center network. So there's DC TCP, there's Fastlane, there's other TCP protocol enhancements that might work a little better on the data network side, but like I said, we're running 82% uh, efficient. You know, maybe we push it up another 8%. I don't, I, I don't know. So we, we want to do those tests and see you know, just how much more um, can we squeeze out of the network if we're using another protocol. Um, also, 40 gig E's coming online, and they're getting cheaper. Uh, 10 gig E's getting cheaper. 40 gig E's getting cheaper. So we're going to try running it on 40 gig E as well. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Yeah, jumbo packets are turned on, yeah. And uh, it's actually tuned for the Arista switch. Yes, sir. How do you test it concurrently? I'm sorry? Concurrent uh, um, We're running, well, when we're running Basho Bench and Cause Bench, we're running like you know, 250 concurrent users. So, so we are, so there's a, um, if, if, you, if you use Basho Bench to test your cluster? Well, we, we are not to do that. Okay. Well, yeah, there's a setting in there that says con in Bashabench there's a concurrent setting, and you basically set that to how many concurrent processes you want, and um, it'll actually fire up that many uh, um, virtual, you know, Erlang virtual machines. Uh, or I'm sorry, not Erlang virtual machines. It'll it'll set up that many Erlang processes to pump data at your cluster. Um, you want to make sure that you're not overloading the thing that's generating the load. <laughs> so you want to make sure you're measuring the right thing. So we, that was another thing we did test. We want to make sure that our load generators weren't overloaded. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, that's another thing to test. Yes, sir. Why, why was the distribution of network traffic to separate nodes mm -hmm. uh, limiting uh, from the network bandwidth? Because you're using a switch, right? Yes. So your network backbone is probably much greater than 10 gigabits. That's correct. But you've got to also realize you are writing the the load the load balancer that's there's a load balancer that's running so when it's when it's sending load each one of these six nodes is running reXCS so any one of them can take a write oh, it's three unicast connections. yeah so so every one of those is getting bombarded with connections and they're all talking to each other yeah no it's it's fine it's um yeah it, it, that's why that was confusing us to for a while too because we were thinking God, you know it, it's point to point it, it, it's routing the stuff it should be fine mm -mm. no because they're all talking to each other so yeah you do get more collisions and and network dropouts and things like that yes sir. Um, we tried a couple of different configurations. Um, we tried, we were originally running the load balancer on node one of the, of the cluster. And then we thought, yeah, that's probably not a really good idea because you're actually getting an extra write in there. So we moved the load balancer into the, um, onto the load generator node. So the load generator would basically write, Bash of actually write to like a uh, local host. And then localhost would spread that look, that right out to all six nodes, and um, found that that didn't actually make that much difference. Um, and then the uh, we also tried, um, okay, what if we instead of running to CS, we just write directly to React and just bypass CS altogether? Didn't make much difference. We're still seeing the same thing. So um, I think the CS, the overhead, is not really on the network side because when it gets its right, it's getting its right over the pub, our, our public network interface. CS takes that data and then it's um, 
it's it's communicating to itself. That node is communicating to itself over uh, the local host connections, and then it's deciding, okay, which of my nodes does the write need to go to to the React connection? So it's then splitting it up. It's either sending it to itself and two other nodes, or it's sending it to three other nodes using the React connection. So the CS just sits in the front of that. Yes, sir. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, stanchion is um, not the load balancer. So stanchion is, no, yeah. Um, we are, we're only using stanchion when we we're actually setting up buckets and thing, or you know, setting up users. I mean, you could run it on all six. I mean, you could. I mean, we were just running on one, but the stanchion, the stanchion's not. The stanchion is not being used when you're doing load tests. Mm. Yeah. So the users, so 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 stanchions for the users and for the buckets, and those are already set up before the load test starts. Mm. Yeah, stanchions not going to cause a bottleneck to load testing because it, it's 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 already done. It's thing before the load test even begins. So, yeah. Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, that's about that was our running some performance. Now that all that said, um, customers totally different, totally different group because every customer uh, is it has. There are, we have, uh, we're dealing with a lot of systems integrators, and they have end user customers, and their end user customers have different application workloads. So um, we can say, hey, we get this 375 you know, mega, maybe bits per second, and that's 375 one meg photos every second written to disk. That's a lot of photos. Do you need that many photos? Do you, you know, how are your users generating that many photos? Is is this good enough? And then they come back and they say, well, we actually have this sort of distribution of writes and reads and deletes, and we'd like to be able to test that. So um, the final thing we did was we actually put a, uh, because um, it's not really a valid, if, if the customer's data is on their application and they're in Japan and they're trying to write data to our lab in Fremont across the internet, you need a pretty expensive pipe to do that, and we, and our IT didn't want to spring for that. Also, you've got la latency and lag and other internet issues, and so that's not really a good test of the performance. So um, we, we've convinced our customers that hey, you know, Bash Bench, Cause Bench, you can you can emulate any of your any of the performance characteristics of your application. You can emulate them with these things. So we wrote this, um, and then all we have to do is give them a really Lightweight web interface with you know you can use like a T1 line connected to our web interface because you're not driving data across the internet into our cluster you're you're generating it locally but you're displaying the data on a on a web interface so what we did was um, so that customers could try before the they buy and we didn't have to ship them a rack and they've got all these different end users with different applications um, we would try to get the customer to tell us what does your application do what does it look like what is its mix of operations. And um, so we built this web portal for them. Uh, we allow them to reserve a rack of their own for five days. They log in the portal. They um, enter their test parameters in there. The website adds the test to the RabbitMQ queue. Uh, it sends, and then the RabbitMQ process makes an SSH connection to a load generating host, starts the test. Once the test is complete, all the test data and graphs are copied back from the load generators to the website. And tests can run on any cluster at any Seagate lab in the world as long as we can make an SSH connection to a load generator at the site. So that's kind of cool because it turns, as it turns out, after we did this, there were other groups that were also doing load performance in other parts of the world. And they're like going, oh, how do you do load performance? And we're like, well, if you want, we can, you can use this website and just give us an SSH connection to your load generator and boom, away you go. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. So um, we're actually uh, going to be setting up more clusters in other parts of the world where the equipment is and where the power is. and. Uh, having them available for tests at different times. Um, this is what the front of the website looks like, uh, Stratostore website. Run test results about and log out, pretty simple. Uh, and then there's some sample tests with, you can see the old Basho bench um, uh, graph output. Um, queue up a new test, you put your parameters in, you can pick from a, uh, 
sample of uh, saved tests and run that or you know, from the pull down or you can create your own and save it as a repeatable test. Uh, once you queue it, we have a visualization. You can go in and look at the graph results of your particular test and see, you know, uh, for, uh, to answer your question, objects per second or megabytes per second, which I didn't like. I said, I'll, next time I'll, I'll bring that data too. Um, and uh, get a little visualization of there. Uh, you get all the data. Um, once it's all done, all the data is copied back to the web server. You can then download the logs, the CSV files, whatever you want, do your own analysis on them. Um, verify that we were doing the computations correctly and uh, uh, you know, check for any errors, anything like that. And that's about it. Um, presentations available at Bitly uh, if you are it's actually on Dropbox, but uh, it's, I, the Dropbox link was this long and the Bitly link was this long, so I made a Bitly link. Um, and I'm at Earl Ruby on Twitter and uh, also on LinkedIn and I got a blog that I haven't written much on lately, but I, I'd like to put this video up there as soon as uh, I get a link for it, and uh, that's about it. So.